So here they are, the uh, major players, the pioneering companies in the field. And uh, clearly they're Sigfox. They're the true pioneers who started off that entire field. Um, they're using ultra narrowband technology um, and then the sub gigahertz bands. So this is 868 megahertz in Europe and 915 in the United States, uh, depending on which region you are in. Uh, it is operating over a very, very long range and uh, the links are symmetrical. That means the uplink is much better than the downlink and the difference is typically around uh, 10 to 16 dB, which is quite a lot, one has to say. So you have much better uplink capability and downlink capability. Now, the business approach of Sigfox is to be an operator. So they want to be the uh, Verizons, the Oranges, the Vodafones of this world. So that means you can't actually buy a base station. You can buy a data contract. Uh, you can buy off-the-shelf nodes, which you connect to your sensors, and they would then communicate with uh, Sigfox infrastructure, uh, and you would pay a monthly bill and would essentially get the data. And uh, that's pretty good, I have to say, because you don't have to worry about connectivity, right? So it seems like an expensive deal when you run these solutions. But truth is, it's uh, where Sigfox is really operational. It's a massive value add. The problem is, is if uh, Sigfox is not in an area where you have your deployment, because then your the rollout strategy becomes very dependent on their own rollout strategy. And that clearly is a business weakness, which you don't want to be in. Uh, from a historical point of view, it is a fascinating company, really, uh, headed by uh, the CEO Ludovic. And um, he had exited a previous venture. And uh, at that time, he thought, let's do something big, something disruptive. It was a time when, uh, you know, quite a lot of people have been dismissed in the wireless world. So he hired the best people in France he could, and he founded Sigfox. And he called me up at some point when I was uh, CTO of World Sensing and said, hey, Misha, look, we got a technology here where when you, uh, when you switch it on, you just need a single base station for the whole city. And that just rescued us at that point because we had uh, one of the biggest smart city rollouts in the world and we signed the contract, but the Zigbee technology we used was really difficult to use because I had people there, it was very, wasn't very reliable, so it's quite just really expensive and cumbersome. So to use a Sigfox technology was really fantastic. It literally rescued our contract at that time. And of course, that helped uh, the company and Ludovic to prove to the investors that there's demand, which in turn allowed him to get investment. And, uh, and, and the rest is history, as they say, right? So Sigfox has expanded significantly. They have now um, almost 100% coverage in France, uh, very good coverage in Spain, ramping up all around the world. And uh, it's an interesting company really to follow. The other pioneer in the field is uh, LoRa. It's now being branded as LoRa, but it doesn't start as LoRa. Originally, it was Cyclio. And again, a friend of mine calls me up uh, with whom I worked in France Telecom when I was still there. And uh, he said, Misha, I got something like uh, Sigfox, but I believe it's, it's actually better. Well, so here we go. We then called, we, we deployed the technology again. We're the first one to give them a commercial rollout. And uh, Cyclio was acquired by a chip manufacturer, Semtech, and the solution now is branded as the LoRa solution. And the model is very different, and the technology is very different. While Sigfox communicates over a very narrow bandwidth, LoRa tries to communicate over a really wide bandwidth, but uses CDMA spreading sequences. So it gets a lot of uh, path loss gain by um, descrambling the message. So a bit like 3G works, right? And um, it's also operating on the sub gigahertz band, so the license exam band there. But from a business point of view, it is more like a vendor. So you can buy the stuff off uh, the, the uh, LoRa vendor and you can deploy it yourself and you can run your own network. So it's also now an open alliance. So there are different companies essentially evolving the technology. It's not a standardized technology, but it's open and it's constantly evolving. And the good thing is, is you don't depend on a single company like Sigfox. If something goes wrong with Sigfox, suddenly all your data stuff will be lost. Whereas with LoRa, you can be assured that there will always be companies who can actually provide that connectivity. Now, what else? Uh, in Gino, it used to be OnRamp, and it's an American company which operates now in the 2.4 gigahertz ISM band. 
and it uh, provided uh, oil and gas companies their backbone. And uh, they essentially changed uh, their branding now and are also connecting with a proprietary radio uh, Internet of Things devices. And finally, we got New, a pioneer on its own. It's a British company which uh, focused initially on TV white space. So that's a uh, spectrum band, which is essentially decommissioned from TV bands uh, to be used in the mobile context. And uh, at some point they realized that maybe that's not a good business because it was really country dependent. And they said, hey, we, we don't want to use um, the Sigfox and LoRa bands because there's the, they're using bands which are uh, license exam bands. There's a lot of interference. You can't offer service level agreements. Why don't we use the operator band? And uh, of course, the operator said you can't use it because we use it for data and for voice. So uh, Newell said, hey, why don't we use the guard bands instead? So uh, those skilled in the arts know that when I make a phone call, I'm using a certain spectrum. And if somebody next to me is uh, browsing the Internet, they may use a different piece of spectrum, but they're not sitting uh, just side by side. There's a little bit of space there simply because the filters are not perfect. So therefore, you have a guard band where Newell claimed you could communicate in and actually deliver IET traffic. So they went to BT and did a British Telecom and did a trial in Milton Keynes uh, in our smart city city in, in the UK and proved that that's possible. At that point, uh, Huawei woke up and acquired the company for $25 million and together with Vodafone and China Mobile pushed the solution into 3GPP. And that was a real revolution because for the first time there was a technology which wasn't really designed by the big giants. So neither by Ericsson, nor by Nokia, uh, nor by Alcatel at that time, nor by, um, uh, by Huawei. Uh, so in, an alien, in a sense, the strangest technology comes into 3GPP and everybody had to work around this. And uh, uh, Huawei, Vodafone and China Mobile, they claimed it's really needed now because by the time the original 3GPP timeline said we have IoT uh, on the market would be too late. So originally we planned for 2020, 2021 uh, to have a, a really uh, well-developed uh, Internet of Things radio on the market. But it would have been too late because most of the market would have been developed. Connectivity would have gone to companies like Sigfox or ecosystems like LoRa. So therefore they wanted something quick. And uh, there was a lot of discussion going on, a lot of negotiations, but finally we're there. And that type of technology has led today to what we call to as narrowband IoT. Uh, so narrowband IoT is something we talk about in a moment. It's uh, very different to what Newell had designed originally, but it was really that acquisition of Newell and that uh, early trial and vision of Newell which enabled narrowband IoT to be here today, release 13, uh, in summer 2016.